guys. We now have cockroaches running around the theater, so <laughs> especially because these ones give birth to a lot of babies. So. <laughs> um, welcome to Sense of Place season 14, the last event. Wow, we made it. We are officially teenagers. My name's Sarah Fox. I'm the host and curator of Sense of Place. I'm so excited for tonight for a lot of reasons that you're going to hear about. I'm also just excited to say season 14 has happened and season 15 is already underway as far as our planning. The other thing I'm really excited about is I would love if you guys would all help me give a round of applause to our 4-H Bug Club member, Asher Epstein here. Man, Asher, come here for a sec, will you, buddy? There's nothing I love more than kids because they have figured out um, how to stay curious on a regular basis, huh? So, Asher, I have a question for you. Let's see. Is this working? Will you test it? No. Oh, no. Not yet. Let's try now. No. Nope. Okay. Let's try once more. Hmm? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Woo! Nice work. Asher, will you tell me how old you are? Seven. Seven years old. We were talking ahead of time about how sometimes in the moment you can forget those basic facts. Yeah. You know what? Sometimes when I get up here, I forget that I need to tell people my name. Isn't that silly? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I have a question for you. When did you start getting interested in bugs? Um, like two years ago. Like five. So five years old? And is it Maybe okay to oh last gosh. year? Maybe last year. <laughs> okay, but you're seven now. Um, is it okay that I call them bugs, or am I supposed to call them insects? Well, um, um, well, actually, not all of them are bugs. Not all of them are actual bugs. Tell me what's well, up. Well, actual bugs have to have three legs. They have to have three legs, and. I think wing. So three legs on each side. Yeah. Man, I'm already learning something. Now, one of the things I wanted you to tell me was, what's one of your favorite insects? One of my favorite insects is a Goliath beetle, which is the heaviest beetle in the world. It's called a, a Goliath beetle? Yeah. And it's the heaviest beetle in the world. Where does it live? Not here in Hood River, does it? I don't know where it lives. OK. <laughs> <laughs> you probably need to take a, a long trip to that place whenever yeah. you find out where it is. OK, mom and dad, trip to find a Goliath beetle. Any idea how much a Goliath beetle might weigh? No. No? Wait, as much as me? Probably not. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Okay, then another thing I was curious about. Are there any insects? You have a pretty cool collection out there. Are there any insects that you wish you had in your collection that are not in it yet? Um, probably a Goliath beetle. <laughs> okay. <well. laughs> I think, and so can you show me with your hands how big a Goliath beetle might be? Like this big? Here, show everyone else here. And then, can I ask you one more question? Thanks for doing this. Can I ask you one more question? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, what is one cool insect fact that maybe we don't know? Um, well, tarantulas, they flick their furs out, which is like needles, and they flick them at their predators, and it, it's like a ton of needles hitting their predator. No way. Did you guys know that? No. Someone did. <laughs> so kind of like a porcupine can shoot its yeah. spikes out of tarant. I'm glad. Is that a tarantula that you have out there? No. Oh. oh. I don't, I don't well, 
don't know what that, what I is it? I think all tarantulas can do that. Okay, well I'm glad that one out there is under glass then. Yeah. Maybe later if we need some help with something back on the desk. Maybe will you help me later if we need some help? Yeah. If I need some support? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for coming tonight, for putting so much time into all your work and to helping teach some of us in the lobby about insects. I really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, you guys, here for Asher. You can go sit down. Thank you, buddy. Man, I have been thinking about having Asher here for many, many months. Um, so thank you again for coming here to CCA. For those of you tuning in from the live stream, thank you for tuning in tonight and all season and when you were able to, to help donate to support that really important way that people access sense of place. Um, one of the things I want to talk about before we get to Maggie and the Battle of the Bugs tonight is our sponsors. And um, I did a little bit of research Maggie was kind to say she was impressed, but I don't think it's really that impressive, but we're going to try here. This is the green lace wing. This is a green lace wing. Maybe some of you guys already knew that. I think Asher's saying he knew that. Okay. Oh, you have one? Okay. Well, look it. Now I'm dropping some knowledge on you, buddy, okay? <laughs> So I was doing some research and this is an insect that we have here in the gorge and I decided this is our sponsors because I learned, correct me if I'm wrong Asher, that green lace wings do something called tremulations and it's a certain moving and these vibrations that help send messages out into the world and for me, our incredible sponsors, many of whom have been with us for 14 seasons help us send little vibrations of this place out into the world via our audience members and the stories we get to have with our speakers. And so if you are in this room and you are a sponsor, you are one of these beautiful creatures in my mind. So please give a round of applause to all of our sponsors. And then this critter, Many of you guys may know that Sense of Place is a program of Mount Adams Institute, and Mount Adams Institute is a local nonprofit doing work on a national level to help people connect to the natural world. So they have all different ways that they're helping people, both big and small, access and connect to place. And this critter is a lady beetle. This is a juvenile, and this is an adult. And what I and we're going to hear more about them tonight. Um, and MAI, in my mind, is this transformative organization that's helping people both connect to the natural world and also transform their own lives. So MAI, in my mind tonight, is the lady beetle. And like I said, Maggie's going to tell us way more than that. Um, the last thing I want to tell you about, Tim, are you over there in the dark? OK, Tim, come on out. I don't know if you guys have all met Tim yet. This is Tim Harkins. Get into the, you gotta get into the light. Yes, don't pretend like you don't know theater because I know you know how this works. So we are about to tuck Sense of Place live events in for the summer, but things are happening at CCA and Tim Harkins is the new executive director here at CCA. So I want you guys to give him a big fat welcome. <laughs> Tim, is, he's been here for a little bit, um, but let me grab my mic. But I waited to force him onto the stage to do things because you've had a few things going on. Yeah. Um, Still. Yeah. <laughs> you, got, you, you haven't got it all figured out yet? Not yet. Okay. A little more time. <laughs> all right. Let me get this turned on real quick. I told Tim that what I wanted him to tell me was what, his, what you would be if you were an insect or your favorite insect, either or. Okay. Um, what would I be if I was Okay. <laughs> Your voice is Carrie, so in this I, um, I also did show him a praying mantis costume that I did not discover in time because otherwise you would have rocked it. I know it was. It was. I would have rocked it. Yeah. So why don't you um, first tell us what you would be. No, let's say that. Tell okay. us a couple of the highlights of what's coming mm -hmm. and then tell us at the end what insect you would be if you were an insect. So here at CCA, what's coming? 
Uh, well, this weekend we have Oregon Ballet Theater coming for two performances uh, during the ballet. Come check that out. Here we go. Here we go. Um, and uh, we also have summer camps for kids starting in June, so those are back as well. A month-long run of Bat Boy the Musical in May by CGOA, as well as a new gallery op exhibit opening that month as well. But there's lots more coming and in the works, so also you can just go on our website, sign up for our newsletter, and keep informed that way. And Tim, I should say, um, background with, uh, in Chicago with the Humanities Festival? Yeah, it was with the Chicago Humanities Festival, which is a festival of arts and ideas. So in some cases, things like sense of place or author talks, as well as performances and whatnot. Um, I was also at a music and th uh, dance performance venue there for a while, and most recently at Livewire Radio in Portland. Yeah, thanks. We're glad to have you. Okay. We're glad to be here. <laughs> Tell us, what is the insect? Um, you see if you approve, <laughs> Asher, okay? I, uh, thanks for the heads up on this, because <laughs> I uh, will sound much better this way. <laughs> um, but I picked a bee. Okay. Um, which you just had a program on bees, so this audience are, they're experts already. Yeah. Um, but uh, mostly because they're cute, they fly around, uh, they get to, um, they have a really cute dance as well, better dance moves than I do. Um, do you want us to judge that? No, no, okay. no, no, right. no, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, they're also super social, community minded. <laughs> um, and great fundraisers? Yeah, great fundraisers. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, and uh, I just uh, like the importance and of them in the larger world as pollinators is super important. And I think also it is uh, like the being a catalyst for the creation of other things is kind of what I do in my human life, just in a different way. Very well done. Thank you. Tim Harkin. Okay. Maggie Freeman, Battle of the Bugs. Ooh, nice ears. Um, so this has been a long time coming for a lot of reasons. I think if anyone was here for our orchard talk a few months ago, a couple months ago with Leslie Tamora and Adam McCarthy, the topic of insects came up, and that originally was the impetus for this was it's their connection with our local agriculture and orchards. Um, because as you'll hear from Maggie tonight, those two things are very intimately related. Um, personally for me, when I first moved out to the gorge, I can remember very early on being out in the garden and coming across a um, large bug, the kind of thing that I knew if you washed it, it would crunch, which is really the kind of insect I have the hardest time with. And I, with the help of my daughters, we collected it and we knew that there was an entomologist a couple houses down. And so I, I literally walked down to his house and showed him it and he identified it as a marmorated stink bug, which we'll hear more about tonight. Um, yeah, oh, that's the right response, you guys. You hear marmorated stink bug is, ooh, they're not good. Um, so I also then have sort of watched the seasons as there's the, all the box elders come out and then learning from the orchardists some of the ways that we're using pests, um, not only looking at them as these foes that can cause us problems, but also the way we can use insects to really be our allies in what's going on. And so Maggie is going to talk some about insects in general. She has the kind of curiosity that often gets lost as we become adults. I know when I spoke to her on the phone about doing this, um, I th you know, she was a little apprehensive, but then as we got into talking about bugs, she said, oh my God, I love talking about parasitoid wasps. I can talk about parasitoid wasps all night. <laughs> and I knew that was my gal. Uh, <laughs> that kind of curiosity is the sort of thing I look for when I'm looking for sense of place speakers. Um, and I'm so grateful for folks like her who have this depth of knowledge and things that, uh, that I don't. Um, the other thing I wanted to share, because at the end of the show, with her help and maybe Asher's help, we're gonna help me overcome my own, a little bit of fear. When I was living with a family in India, I was sleeping underneath one of those mosquito nets and it was very, very hot. It was in a very small village. And as always happened around 6 p.m., the electricity cut out and we wouldn't have electricity until the middle of the night when it would 
kick back on. So there was no fan. You're just in there sort of sweating it out. And I can remember one night laying there sweating. I would put like a wet bandana on my neck to try to just stay a little bit cool. And I'm laying there just falling asleep. And all of a sudden, I hear this hissing. And I think, that cannot be good. <laughs> and I get my little headlamp out, and I'm in my net, and I'm shining it around and shining around. And all of a sudden, I stop on this huge thing on the wall that's shiny. And I realize there is a cockroach making that noise on the wall. And to someone like Asher, maybe that wouldn't be a big deal. Or maybe that would be exciting. <laughs> to me, because I have not done as well with insects, I got a little bit scared. <laughs> and instead of just staying in my net or ignoring it, I went and found the 11-year-old girl that I was staying with. <laughs> and she came and just grabbed it off the wall and threw it out the window. <laughs> I'm not proud of it, you guys, OK? <laughs> well, so talking with Maggie, she, we met last week. And she said, should I bring my hissing cockroaches? I mean, let's just be honest. They don't live in the gorge, so maybe we don't really need to bring them. I, I think I asked her, are they going to interrupt the talk? You know, are they going to be hissing, causing problems? You know, I had some reasons why she shouldn't bring them. But then I was, I was thinking about Asher today, and I was thinking about what Maggie suggested, and I texted her, and I said, no, now, so where did we land on the hissing cockroach thing? And I said, I think you should bring them. And we're going to try to help me overcome my phobia at the end of all this. We'll see. And maybe with Asher's help. So stay tuned. I may hold a hissing cockroach. And if I do, I'm going to be looking for some other people out there who look nervous to hold them too, OK? <laughs> so with that, please help me welcome Maggie Freeman to Sense of Place season 14. <laughs> I was having so much fun talking to Asher that I forgot to get my mouse out. So <laughs> one second. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, hi, guys. Um, so I've been watching the number of people that have purchased tickets for the last week because it's like, no one's going to come. Who wants to learn about insects? Uh, and so this is wild. <laughs> this is really great to see this many people here. So thank you. OK, so the good, the bad, and the ugly of the insect world. So we'll start off with my path to entomology. Um, maybe some of you read my bio. Uh, I really, really loved my big brother. I still love him. Um, <laughs> and everything he thought was cool was obviously very, very cool. And his childhood dream was to become an entomologist. Uh, he's now a salmon biologist, but. Um, <laughs> so I spent my childhood out collecting insects, making them fight in jars. Sorry, sorry, insects. Um, and then every year, we'd go visit my aunt in eastern Washington, and we'd collect uh, a praying mantis to bring home as a pet. So I was just introduced to insects at a really young age, and I wanted to be cool and be able to hang, so I obviously liked them, uh, and now I actually love them. Um, and this little mantis actually in this picture was uh, an exotic one I had as an adult because I haven't grown out of that habit. <laughs> um, and she grew into a beautiful orchid mantis, and she is in a box uh, behind me. So if you want to see what she turned into, I have her. <laughs> um, uh, so loved insects as a, as a child. I was going to my uh, undergrad at the Evergreen State College, go gooey ducks, in Olympia, Washington. Um, and I needed to take an upper division science class, and one of the only ones available that quarter was entomology. So I took that just on a whim and had a great time. And it's like, well, this is going to be a great hobby, but who works in entomology? Um, and then went off and worked for a while. And then I came back to school, started doing some organic farming classes. And I really loved the pest management side of it, especially in a way or in a system where you want to use as few um, 
chemical inputs as possible, even if they're organic ones. Uh, so I was really fa fascinated with that, and that drove me back to entomology again. Um, I was then later able to get my master's at Washington State University, go Cougs. <laughs> uh, um, and then after I graduated in 2019, I started working at OSU Research and Extension here in the Gorge, go Beebs. So um, I've got an interesting trifecta of mascots there. Um, okay, so my first job in entomology, and this is before I went to do my master's, was at the Washington State Department of Agriculture uh, Exotic Pest Detection Lab in Olympia, Washington. Um, and in this picture, this is way before COVID, but moths' uh, wings are covered in scales. And so I'm processing a bunch of moths and it's really bad to breathe in the scales. Um, so at this lab, we provided services for states west of the Missouri River. Um, every year, the Department of Agriculture does broad uh, pest surveys looking for new exotic insects accidentally introduced to the state. Um, and a lot of these are moths, especially when we're looking at like commodity crops, things like soy and corn. Uh, these are moths or the caterpillars feeding on um, the crops. So we were processing thousands of these traps and these traps were often in like really poor condition. So looking here, you, you probably see nothing because it's just covered with dirt. Um, there's some weird blobs there and maybe that's a moth, uh, but we had to be able to give species level uh, identifications. So if you got, oh no. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. There's gonna be a joke on the next one. <laughs> I'm gonna drink some water, one second guys. There you go. Oh. Um, there's some clear wing moths that are really, really beautiful. They've got, they have black scales on their, on their wings, so th they just look transparent and they're, they're very pretty. They look kind of friendly. <laughs> um, so I was a big fan of the clear wing moths. Uh, hmm. Gypsy moth? Gypsy moth? Uh, they're, which are actually, unfortunately, pretty cute. They're a good looking moth. Um, now called, <laughs> called spongy moth. And I don't know what the spongy comes from, uh, but it's kind of cute, so I'm all for it. Um, what else is some good ones? Some good tiger moths, um, moths that mimic, uh, they look like hummingbirds. <laughs> they feed at flowers at night and they're really good at hovering. Um, so those ones are really cool. Is there anything I can, should I do anything you on my end? We killing really well. Great, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me know if you want me to um, pull out the HDMI and put it. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, guys, how are you going to determine <laughs> what species these are? <laughs> oh, put the cap on. You're going to look at their genitalia. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> That's the only way. So, it turns out insects have very species specific genitalia, and they're especially elaborate in moths. Um, this one is corkscrewed and covered in spikes. Uh, which, you know, the, the more precise shape, the better you are to pass on your genes, I guess. So it's really wild in the moth world. And so here's just a cu couple of pictures of other ones that are just, you can see how radically different they are. So it is, it, that's, that's what we would do. I'd spend hours and hours and hours just ripping off abdomens and then looking at the genitalia and being like, oh, nope, this is not what we're looking for. Um, but the clear wing moth, the which, I, sorry, I have to look at your orientation. Okay, bottom left, that's the clear wing moth, and it's, it's the friendliest of the genitalia. It's very <laughs> soft and like pleasant looking, so I, I really appreciated that moth. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a, it, so okay, so this job was one of those, either you were gonna be like, yeah, this is it. This is, this is what I wanna do with my life, or you go running. Uh, but I was the weird one that's like, this was great. This is endlessly fascinating. Um, and so while working at the Department of Ag, uh, a new pest was introduced to Washington, and this gave me an opportunity to do my master's. And so this is the lily leaf beetle. This beetle is originally from Eurasia. It was accidentally brought to North America in the 1940s when people brought their favorite lily with them. Um, and then the beetle's been spreading westward since 
Um, it feeds on lilies and fritillaria, and this includes our native species as well. Many of our natives are already really endangered, so they don't need anything else, um, making it harder to grow. And so this beetle feeds on the leaves, the flower petals, and after a couple years, uh, it can completely just kill the plant. And in its larval stage, it also will feed on the plant. So the larvae is that blob at the top. Um, they, they cover their backs with their own layer, with a layer of their own feces called a fecal shield. Um, <laughs> cl clever. Uh, this is thought to protect them from desiccating, uh, maybe as a disguise, but so my, my field work was really messy, for sure. So a solution for this uh, beetle was providing a biological control agent. So this is something they've been dealing with on the East Coast for many, many years, and so they had already gone back to the beetle's native range to look for predators that attack this beetle. And they found a couple of wasps that lay their eggs inside of the beetle larvae and they eat them alive. Um, and so before these wasps were allowed to be brought into the United States, they had to go through years of host specificity testing, making sure that they could only attack this beetle and nothing else that is here in North America. And once that was determined, they were approved for release. Luckily, this all happened years before the beetle got here. So I was able to just buy them. Um, so that was really nice. So it was a cool project, and I'd already knew I liked parasitoids, but now I really, really knew I liked parasitoids. Okay, so before we get into the bulk of tonight's talk, I want to give you some definitions just for some context uh, to what we'll be talking about. So natural enemies, and these will be geared towards insects specifically. Uh, natural enemies are organisms that kill, decrease the repu reproductive potential of or otherwise reduce the numbers of other organisms. So this is insects that eat other insects, bringing down populations to very manageable levels. And then within the natural enemy world, there are generalists and specialists. Generalists will eat a broad range of insects, whereas the specialists have a very restricted diet and some of them only eat one other type of insect. And then within the specialists, we've got parasitoids, which is my jam. Um, the parasitoids <laughs> are organisms whose young develop um, on or within another organism, eventually killing it. Uh, they are super highly specialized. They're able to track down their hosts via environmental cues or like vibrations in the host plant. So examples of this are this poor caterpillar. It, well, it's a tomato hornworm. Um, they're not here, but they eat tomatoes elsewhere in the country, and they're a really bad pest. Um, so as they're chewing on the tomatoes, tomatoes release uh, plant volatiles that the wasp then is able to track down uh, the, the caterpillar, and then those are its eggs all over its back. So they'll hatch and then eat, eat the caterpillar. Uh, in the middle is an ichneumonid wasp. Uh, this one is really cool. So this one, so the, the large thing that's like looping over into the, uh, the log there is her ovipositor. So this is what she lays her eggs through. Um, so she, she finds, you know, a suitable log, and then she's feeling for vibrations, and then she s drills into the log and then lays her egg inside of a larvae that's all the way in the log, which is wild. It's so specialized. Uh, and then the last one, which is, I think, the friendliest of the parasitoids, is an egg parasitoid. So their larvae hatch out and just eat the yolk uh, and then emerge. So they're just eating yolk, but that's th they're, they're nicer. Okay, and then finally, the difference between parasitoids and parasites. So parasitoids actually kill the host, where a parasite, things like ticks and fleas and this horrible isopod that eats this fish's tongue so it can eat the food that the fish eats, uh, they don't intend to kill their host, they just want to slurp nutrients off of them. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, so now in, into the real meat of our talk tonight. We're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of uh, uh, trying to grow tree fruit um, here in the gorge. And these are the pests that we'll largely be focusing on. So the tree fruit industry is actually a super important thing here in the gorge. Um, these values are from 2022 and 2021, but 
pair is valued $67 million coming from here in the gorge, $55 million for cherries. We are the second largest producer of pears in the U.S. This is the state of Oregon. We produce the most pears in Oregon. Um, and then third largest cherry producer, and we produce the most cherries in Oregon as well. So it's a really important industry. And the original farmers didn't have many tactics for being able to control pests. There just weren't many options uh, for them to spray pests that were affecting their crop. So back in the early 1900s, one of the things they did have was lead arsenate. Um, this is not good for people. Um, it doesn't break down quickly. Um, it would accumulate in the soil and it could last for decades. Uh, and then also it's broad spectrum, so meaning it can kill all insects that it comes into contact with. Then in the 1940s, chemists came up with new chemicals that uh, seemed like a better solution, DDT. And DDT w does work very well. Um, so it, it, it does work really well, uh, but it also doesn't break down quickly. Um, and it, so it was accumulating in the soil and it was starting to kill birds because the, you know worms were eating it, birds were eating the worms, and then it was starting to affect their shells. And so there were unintended consequences that you know researchers didn't know about at the time. Um, and then it was documented through Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Uh, this led to an environmental movement that then led to the creation of the, Ent the Environmental Protection Agency, which now oversees pesticide use in the United States. Also, it led to the banning of DDT in North America. Ooh. Sorry, one moment. Okay, so now growers use um, an integrated pest management approach. So. Growers want to know that the pest is actually in their orchard before they need to manage it. They also want to know, uh, we set action thresholds. So if, if a certain pest is at a really low level, you maybe don't need to control it. You can just let it be. But if it does reach a level where it's going to start impacting um, how much money you're actually going to make with your fruit, that's the only time that you then may use a pesticide. Pesticides have also come a really, really far long way. They break down really quickly, and th some of them are super targeted. Things like uh, Bt is a bacteria that is then eaten by like a caterpillar and just kills that caterpillar and doesn't affect anything else in the orchard. So things have really come a long way, and growers, you know, they, they care about their insects. Um, the growers here are really, really great. Like people talk about like, oh, the year that I lost my yellow jackets. So, like, growers care. Growers care a lot about their insects. Um, so they, they are all on board for this integrated pest management approach. So I now work for the Oregon State University Mid-Columbia Agricultural Research and Extension Center. We call it McCarrick. Um, it is located kind of across the street from Good News Gardening, um, down Experiment Station Drive. The Master Gardeners have a plant sale there. Uh, also, soil and water conservation does a native plant sale there, so some of you may have been there, uh, and it's beautiful. I, I've got a great view of both Hood and Adams, so it's, it's a really nice place to be able to, to have an office. Um, so Oregon State University is a part of, uh, it, it is the Oregon State's land-grant university, and land-grant universities, I think, are really cool. Uh, the purpose of them is to provide readily available research-based programs and educational resources with the goal of improving the lives of the individuals, families, and communities within the state. So these are uh, universities with a real mission to benefit the people living in their state. Um, and they do this through a couple of ways, both through programs at the university and then through the uh, extension and research centers. So we're one of those satellite centers. And our extensions provide some, r our extension experts provide some really cool things for our community, things like family and community health uh, ex experts and advice, um, the Master Gardener program, which helps teach people uh, how to do sustainable gardening, our f and our 4-H program. Um, you can also submit questions about plants and animals um, and insects uh, through OSU um, Ask Extension. So it's a really awesome resource. So our lab is more of the research side of this, and so we are here to serve the growers in the Columbia Gorge. So the growers will set what priorities they are 
most interested in having researched. We then take those priorities and that guides what our research programs are. Um, we then are able to provide opportunities for master and PhD, st PhD students to come have on hands um, uh, actual uh, projects here uh, in Hood River. We also provide opportunities for undergrads and high school students uh, to come work for us in the summers. I've had some really good kids from this town. Um, and what I think is really great too is that at the end, all of our research is to be given back to the growers and to the public. Uh, and we do this through um, publications, grower meetings, uh, public meetings, and uh, extension bulletins. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, now to the pests. So the first pest we're gonna talk about is the codling moth. And the codling moth was first brought over from Eurasia on accident um, back in the 1800s. This moth lays her egg out on the outside of pears and apples. It then hatches out into this caterpillar. It chews its way into the center. Um, and then in that picture in the middle, you can see that brown stuff. That's their, their, their frass, their poop coming out. Uh, so they just completely ruin crops. And if left unmanaged, they can like ruin more than 50% of the crop. Um, and this is where like the worm in the apple comes from. It, it's actually a caterpillar. But there happen to be a couple of really good environmentally friendly ways to control a uh, coddling moth. One of them is through mating disruption. So they create a synthetic female pheromone. So this is the pheromone that the female emits when she wants a male to come find her to mate. And then uh, she's able to lay these viable eggs on the fruit. Um, but by creating a bunch of fake ladies that you stick throughout the orchard, the males are just flying and flying and flying and they're not able to find her. So it keeps the females from having viable eggs. Uh, the other option is sterile insect release. So labs will rear tons of these codling moths. They put them through an x-ray machine, which then renders them sterile. Uh, and then they take lots of these sterile moths, release them in the orchard, and then it just decreases the opportunity for the female to mate with an actual viable male. So this method has been used widely in Canada. Um, so it's been over a decade that they've been doing it, and they, they dropped the wild population of this moth by over 94%. So greatly decreasing the number of these moths without needing to spray at all. Um, and this reduced the pesticide use by 96%. So it's a, it's a really good and interesting way to be able to control this moth. However, sometimes you do need to spray for the moth, um, especially... Hood River's got a tricky situation in that they're surrounded by a lot of houses and a lot of us have backyard apple trees that we probably don't treat. Uh, so it ha we have all these reservoirs of these moths that can then affect the fruit in the orchards neighboring us. So sometimes you do need to spray and sprays can kill beneficial insects um, and then you'll get uh, s uh, these secondary pests, th their populations will just boom and then you're having to deal with other uh, pests, thing like things like Paracilla. So Paracilla is kind of like an aphid, um, both in size and how they feed. They have piercing sucking mouth parts, so they stab into the leaf and slurp up the phloem, so they're just drinking a bunch of this sugary juice. Um, and then because it's so much water, they're just trying to concentrate the sugars. They have this like really liquidy poop called honeydew. And the, <laughs> the, the honeydew <laughs> drips onto the pears. Uh, causing russeting, and then fungal spores can get onto this sugary substance on the pears, which causes sooty mold, which gr uh, further reduces the value of these pears. Um, and having long hair working in orchards, I can uh, sadly attest, it is it's very sweet. The, the honeydew is very sugary. Um, so, so, yeah, makes sense that the fungus is doing great on it. Um, okay. So one of the projects that my lab is working on is trying to create an action or like inaction threshold for all of these beneficial insects that eat Paracilla in the orchards. We want, we're putting out these traps with uh, plant volatile volatiles that bring in the natural enemies. They, they use these plant volatiles to find the Paracilla in the orchards. And we want to be able to give growers a number of like you have 10 green lace wings, you do not need to spray. So this is a project we're working on, um, and the growers have been really excited. 
Okay, now into my favorite of these beneficials. Um, and you're maybe going to notice a uh, ugly duckling to beautiful swan theme. Um, so this is the green lacewing, and they're beautiful. They're bright green. They've got these, uh, you know, nice lacy wings. Uh, and as adults, they just eat nectar. But as their larval or immature stage, they're like out of nightmares. They're really scary looking. They're called aphid lions, and they've got these very specialized mouth parts. So it's like almost like a sickle, but a straw as well. So they stab it into the scylla, and then they inject it with saliva, which starts to digest them, and then they slurp them up. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's so metal. Uh, they're, really, they're really scary looking, uh, but I think they're really cool. Also, uh, so they'll... I don't know why they do this. They'll then stick dead bodies on their back, <laughs> like on, on the hairs. They just like cover themselves. And it's, I, I don't know, they're wild. Uh, they're maybe my favorite insect. Um, and then the lady beetle, beautiful, sweet looking adult. And then these weird, scary looking uh, larval stage. Uh, both the adult and the, the immature stages both eat the scylla. So they're a really good natural enemy to have because they, they eat a lot more. Um, and some of you have maybe seen this insect. I have a lot of people ask me, it's like, I found this really creepy thing that was crawling around fast, and it's kind of black and red, and it's like, oh, that's a, that is gonna be a lady beetle. Um, and then if you start looking at like your kale and your roses, you might start seeing these weird orange lumps, and that is the pupating uh, the lady beetle, going through me metamorphosis to become a beautiful beetle. And then surfid flies, uh, they are bee mimics. So they're often yellow and black striped. Uh, they're really good flyers. You'll see them like hovering above flowers. As adults, they eat nectar, uh, but then as their immature form, they're these like ravenous maggots that um, <laughs> track down Scylla, they bite them, uh, which paralyzes them, and then they slurp up the innards. Uh, but then they're really pretty as adults. Uh, earwigs, which, there was even one that I was creeped out by for a while, but I've come around on earwigs. They aren't beneficial in all um, crops. Like, they, they are lettuce and things, so you don't necessarily want them in your garden, but they're really good in the orchard. Their mouth parts aren't strong enough to chew through the skin of the pear, so if they're just moving through your uh, trees, they're just gobbling up aphids, aphids and scylla. Um, and then uh, the thing that maybe will bring you around on them, they're actually really good moms. They, they build nests, they guard their eggs, and then as the eggs start hatching out, they go collect food and provision their babies uh, until they leave the nest, which is w quite sweet and not that common for insects. Uh, and then finally, a parasitoid, of course. So this is the parasitoid that attacks Parasilla. I'm finding tons of them in the orchards right now. I, they're, they're tiny, so it's a tiny, tiny wasp, smaller than a grain of rice. Um, they've got this fun uh, metallic patch on their back, and they lay their egg inside of the scylla nymphs. Um, it then hatches out. They gobble up uh, unimportant tissues until the nymph gets big, about uh, to the size where it would emerge as an adult, and at this point it kills it. It's then able to complete its uh, metamorphosis inside of this exoskeleton, so it's got this nice handy dandy safe spot to be and then it emerges as an adult wasp and I think they're very pretty okay mm -hmm. BMSB boo I know so you've probably all seen this bug um, and this this is a true bug so not every bug is an insect but not every insect is a bug um, so true bugs have these piercing sucking mouth parts uh, which you can see, this big schnoz on this guy. Uh, so this is what it uses to stab into the fruit and then slurp up sugars and then probe into the seeds to get uh, protein. So this, this one's tricky. Uh, so it, it, it's from Eastern Asia. It was found in Oregon in 2004, and it eats so many different crops. Um, it can feed on over 300 different host plants, Things like maples, and then your pear, and your peaches, and then back to hazelnuts, and your oaks. So they're just able to, and they're also really good flyers. They can apparently fly up to 40 miles a day. Probably only a couple miles, but they're really good flyers. So they're just moving throughout our, our system, moving into the orchard, feeding for a bit, flying to a maple. And so you can't necessarily even spray for them because they may not be there. So they're, they're a really tricky one for growers to deal with. Um, 
Here's a picture of what their damage looks like. So they stab their mouth part into the pear, which causes this browning. It can also introduce uh, like bacteria or fungus in these uh, piercing, uh, piercing wounds. Um, so and it, it just renders the fruit unmarketable. Um, <coughs> so it, it is now a, a large agricultural nuisance in the state of Oregon because it affects our pears and our hazelnuts. And it's a big nuisance pest throughout many other states in the U.S. Um, and there's a bunch of different organizations, lots of universities, that were frantically doing research on this, uh, this, this bug to try and figure out ways to help our growers. So one of the things that we have found is a parasitoid, of course. Uh, so researchers went back to the stink bug's native range, found an egg parasitoid, um, that she, this, so this wasp, which is tiny, so you can see she, she's over the two on that penny. So it's really, really small. You'll never see it. You wouldn't know it's a, you wouldn't know it's a wasp. Um, so researchers found this wasp, and in its, the stink bug's native range, this wasp provides 70% control of the stink bug. So keeping the population to very, very manageable levels. Um, so while researchers were doing this host specificity testing on it, uh, we found it in Portland. So it was accidentally introduced as well. And it was established and it was already starting to spread and overall it's gonna be doing a, a, a really good net service over anything bad. So the state of Oregon has granted permission for us and other organizations to rear and release this wasp. Okay, so rearing TJ is pretty easy and it's kind of fun. Uh, so I have to have a a large population of the stink bugs. Um, so I keep the stink bugs in these cages. I give them fresh fruit and, and seeds. And they also really like uh, jelly beans. They just like, they devour jelly beans. So these, they're very, very well cared for. Uh, and then I collect their eggs every day. And then I give their eggs to the wasps and I feed the wasps some honey. And then I'm just able to mass produce these things really easily. We then re release them in locations outside of orchards, just outside of orchards, places where there are uh, other host plants, things like maples and the hazelnuts. That way the wasp can establish just outside of the orchard, start bringing the BMSB population down so they won't be moving into the orchard. And that way, if orchards need to spray, they don't have to worry about killing this wasp because it is already established just outside of the orchard. And so for the last three years, we've been rearing and releasing these guys. Um, and with the collaboration of ODA and other folk at OSU, we've now released over 73,000, uh, which is wild because each female can lay like 200 eggs. So, and there can be 10 generations a year. So that like, I if everybody lived, like I've tried to do the calculations and it just gets unreasonable very quickly. So hopefully they are establishing and starting to, to spread. They are small, so they're not gonna spread super quickly on their own, but uh, we're gonna continue this program with uh, the Department of Agriculture and keep releasing these wasps at new locations. Okay, now we're gonna get into cherry pests. So the first pest we're talking about is the Western cherry fruit fly. And this one is actually native to North America. So this one is something that cherry uh, growers have been dealing with like forever. The female lays her egg, the female fly lays her egg inside of the cherries um, and then her maggots will hatch out and start feeding. Uh, and then it just makes the fruit disgusting. Um, and left uncontrolled, they can uh, ruin like every single fruit on a tree. Um, they're not very good flyers, so they don't spread very fast, uh, which is something, but it is something that uh, orchardists are having to deal with. Um, they also only have one generation a year, which is nice, so you only have to control them once. Um, and one of the th ways that uh, the growers are able to, to control it is using a bait, so like something they want to feed on that has a pesticide in it, which helps kill the flies. Then comes along spotted wing drosophila. So now there was an introduction of this fly. It was first found in California in 2008 in, uh, in strawberries. And so growers were like, oh no, this is a bad one. So everybody started putting out traps, seeing if it was there. And then all of a sudden it was, it was just like everywhere. It was found in the gorge in 2010. And then now it's found in most countries. So this one's been here. 
and it's it's a it's a nasty one to deal with so the female has a serrated ovipositor so this is what she lays her egg through but it has like like these saw structures so she's able to cut through the the fruit skin and deposit her egg um, but then this fly can have it it has a really quick life cycle so there's a new adult like every 10 days so to control them right now the only option is to spray like once a week when when the cherries are ripening um, so they're 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 a bad one they're they're really a hard one to control so what about biological control? There's got to be something that, that we could use to, to control this uh, fly. And of course, of course there's a parasitoid. There always is. Um, so this is the other wasp on my penny. Uh, so it's also very, very small. So researchers went back to the, its native range. The spotted wing drosophila's native range collected infected fruit and waited to see what emerged. And there were a number of parasitoids. Um, and one of them was this wasp, Ganaspis brasiliensis, and this one will only lay her eggs inside spotted wing drosophila. So it won't attack other flies, so it was deemed to be a really safe option. And so it has now been approved for release in both uh, the um, United States and in Canada. And we are trying to rear this wasp as quickly as possible to start releasing. Oregon has the second most releases so far in North America, so good job, Oregon. Um, and our lab will hopefully start rearing this wasp this uh, summer, and I'll start releasing it once again just outside of cherry orchards so it can es establish in things like blackberries and start bringing down the population. And finally, we're going to talk about cherry axe disease, and this one's pretty complicated. Uh, so this disease is caused by a phytoplasma, which I hadn't heard of before this job. Phytoplasmas are plant pathogenic, phloem inhabiting bacteria that are transmitted from plant to plant by phloem feeding insects. Um, and so they are like a bacteria, but they have a different type of cell wall. So they are not, you can't control them with antibiotics. So at this time, there's no cure. Like you can't, you can't do anything to treat your tree. And it causes the fruit to become small and bitter, unmarketable. Um, and eventually it will kill the tree. So at this time, the, your only option is just to cut the tree out. So this is, hopefully gives a better idea of what the pathway's like. So we'll say the first tree is infected with cherry X. Uh, this is a leafhopper. So leafhoppers have piercing sucking mouth parts as well. They slurp up uh, the phloem from this tree, feeding probably on the leaves, and then it will then intake the phytoplasma. The phytoplasma then will infect their salivary gland, and when they move into uh, either another tree or onto the weeds, it will then infect that plant. So there's quite a few weeds that are also hosts for this uh, phytoplasma, things like dandelion and mallow, so like weeds that are just very, very common everywhere. Uh, you, you've got plenty in your yard, I promise. Um, and then they, so other leaf hoppers are then feeding on these already infected weeds and then moving into the trees and infecting the trees. And so, and it, it unfortunately takes years for the trees to start showing symptoms. So you maybe don't even know that you have an infected tree. And so it's probably been spreading throughout the orchard, which is really tricky. So things that we're looking at now is how to repress the weeds. Um, you can have herbicide options. There's also like uh, these row covers or um, uh, dry row covers where you just put like uh, cloth over the row so it suppresses the weeds to just try and drive these leaf hoppers out of your orchard. Um, and then th these are the leaf hoppers. So this is what a leaf hopper looks like. Uh, there's three main species found in Washington. Cherry X seems to be like kind of moving quicker through Washington than in Oregon so far. Uh, the, their three uh, leafhopper species are actually much better vectors than what we have in Oregon. Our most common vector is mostly a grass feeder, and it takes longer for it to become infective or be able to infect other plants. So that's maybe good news for us, but it's still definitely a big problem that our growers are dealing with. So, of course, I'm lo we're looking at parasitoids too. So looking at things that will attack the leafhoppers and hopefully bring their populations down. Uh, there's a couple of different wasps, uh, one that lays eggs, um, inside it's an egg parasitoid, and then this big-eyed fly that has these, I bet you can guess how it got its name. Um, 
it's it's pretty cool looking. Um, so these are the things that we'll be focusing on to hopefully find a parasitoid to help out our growers. So this was just like a tiny glimpse into the insect world and, and how they are so involved in both our environment and our agriculture. Um, so I, I, if any one of you goes out and looks at an insect and wonders what its parasitoid is, I'll know that I've done a good job tonight. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, and I'll, I'll take any questions. It's up, so this is your chance. If you have questions, um, if you don't mind handing this back to that gentleman back there. Hi, Miles. I was wondering, um, the little wasps that like jelly beans, the TJ, mm -hmm. do they like um, jelly bellies or Brock more? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, they, they only like the organic ones from Rose Hours in bulk. Okay. <laughs> That's so their favorite. I'll make sure for my little pet TJ or my Penny back at home, I'll <laughs> get some <laughs> organic jelly beans for him. Nice. Okay. <laughs> well, we pass that forward. I wanted to know, can you uh, tell us the difference between a lady beetle and a ladybug? They're, they're actually beetles. They're not, they're not true bugs. Call them a ladybug. That's fine. Okay. Um, but yeah, they're, they're technically beetles. Okay, so bugs. it is, okay. It's just one of the same. All right. Hi there. Um, I was wondering if you have any sphinx moth, moth samples. I, I have one in a box over here, yeah. I sure do. You should come look at it. Ask and you shall receive, yeah. Perry. Okay, so afterwards we'll come look at bugs and insects. I had the, the incredible pleasure of being in New York and seeing um, Chinese lantern moths, oh, yeah. and I am concerned about those coming here because yeah. they eat trees. Are you, have you seen? Are, is that a concern of ours? Oh, oh yeah, for sure. Um, they're not here yet. They've found them a couple times in Portland dead. They were in nursery stock. Uh, it's probably a matter of time. They love Tree of Heaven, uh, so they'll do well here. The, that's grown all along our railroad tracks. And then they also love grapes. They like they, so they're a really big nuisance for our vineyards. So they're unfortunately beautiful. Um, they're, they're pretty easy to control with pesticides. Uh, so they, they die pretty easily, but they're, they're also really good flyers. They reproduce really fast. Um, when they feed on trees, it just like drips. Yeah, they're 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 pretty bad. They're they're beautiful, unfortunately. But yeah, right here. Oh, hold on. Oh. Thank you, Maggie. Great talk. Um, are there programs for home gardeners who aren't orchardists to receive beneficial insects for managing pests, or is that something that's even a thing? Yeah, well, not not the parasitoids yet. There are certainly you can buy things like green lace wings and lady beetles and praying mantises. So there's definitely. Uh, more generalist natural enemies that are mass reared for um, release, but at this time, the, the parasitoids are too, too special, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right here. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was wondering how big can a praying par 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 mantis. mantis get? Like, how big can it get? How so big can a praying mantis get? Uh, uh, we don't have the giant ones here, but there are giant ones in the jungle that can that can eat birds. So they're they're huge. They're really really big, um, but we don't have them here. Wow. Yeah. Asher, let's go get one of those yeah. too, huh? Uh, right into you your mouth. There you do go. Do you have any of the wasps that are as big as a penny? Yeah, I do. Actually, I have a bunch of live ones with me. So. Yeah. We could. They're in a glass. Everyone jar. gets one, so right? It's like yeah, yeah, take yeah. one. Everybody gets a wasp. Happy um, season yeah, 14 finale. <laughs> yeah. All right, who else has a question? Otis, I gotta make it up to you, buddy. I know I owe you. How do stink bugs get their stink? Good. Okay, question. so okay. they've got these little pores like on on their bellies, and then when you scare them, they like shoot out this alarm pheromone. That smells terrible. And I had one like fly out of the cage onto my face and I was like, ah, and I grabbed it off and it stunk me like right in the eye. And I like, it burned me. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, they smell terrible. 
that was part of the story I didn't tell because I didn't know if it was okay, but now I feel okay, is that when we walked the stink bug to the entomologist, and he was like, it's a stink bug, and I go, how do you know? And he goes, Hunk. And then he goes, smell it. And I was oh, like, yeah. Oh. oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not okay. Way <laughs> beyond my comfort zone. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, so getting back to the um, lantern fly, mm -hmm. the tree of heaven. Mm -hmm. I know that Underwood Conservation District has a, is trying to do with control. For sure. Try to get rid of tree of heaven. Yeah. So how effective is that? Because I see it growing even down in Allentown River and everybody's lot. Yeah. So uh, how, how effective is removing it? Yeah. If we could remove all of it, it would be great. It would definitely slow the spread of it. If it was introduced here, uh, it's going to be a, a, a mass effort. Like, w we'd probably have to fi like hire just crews that that's all they do. Um, because th they're really tenacious. They, they just pop up more and more suckers unless you actually put an herbicide on the, on the stump. Um, yeah, they're, they're, tr so they're invasive. Um, Of course, yeah, uh, for sure, for sure, yeah, just, yeah, for sure, yeah, they're invasive, they don't belong here, <laughs> um, but yeah, just, you know, anything we can do, reducing it, making it so it's not just an easy, you know, just jump from house to house, you know, anything we can do is definitely worthwhile. Who gets to spray the pesticides, and is it easy to become a pesticide sprayer? Okay. Um, yeah. Wow. Uh, so you have to become a, a pesticide applicator. You have to take a test. Um, you can also have a, a pesti pesticide applicator that can then oversee their crews. Um, and, you know, the, the test is not easy, for sure. Uh, but I'm an entomologist. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> would you like more specifics or anything? Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Anything else before we go? Yes, if a little plug here. Um, the Orchard Talk, if you want to go back and watch it on the live stream, they, go, they talk some about what they go through and sort of the work it takes and the expertise to do some of the spraying as well. So Great. Um, the ladybug baggies you can buy at like the nurseries. Mm -hmm. Would you advise buying them? Because I hear they just fly away. They they just fly away. <laughs> so they just fly hey. away. Yeah, yeah. Like All if right. you were using them in more of a greenhouse application, then where you ha are forcing them to stay, or if you have like a tree that is super super covered with aphids, you could also bag them, uh, like using like a five gallon uh, paint. Uh, bag strainer, paint strainer, paint strainer bag, that's it, uh, and then trap them in there and then they'll gobble them up. Um, but yeah, they'll fly away for sure. We'll save you some money tonight. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyone else before? Okay, we're going to do Perry. Boy, it's my, you're f I'm feeling nice tonight because I'm going to come give you the last question, okay? So I was just curious, you mentioned pheromones but then you didn't talk about it more. Oh, uh, so how, how prevalent are they and what's the potential of their use or increasing use and why aren't they used more? So they're, they're definitely well, pretty well used with moths. Moths are really good at, they're, they're more receptive to it. They've got those really big antennae. Um, so they are like, going over a larger uh, area to find the females than other insects, where some will be already kind of in the same area. Um, uh, otherwise, that's a tricky question. Uh, there's some that are used that are even more effective than the one for the codling moth, to where you just like inundate, um, oh, I'm trying to remember, it doesn't matter what the species name is. Uh, this one moth, like if you just put a whole bunch of the pheromone in the orchard, it just like overloads him and he stops looking. <laughs> Whereas the coddling moth will keep looking and looking and looking, but this other one is just like, never mind. Um, so it's used in, in uh, for sure with moths, but I, d I, don't, I don't know why it's not utilized more, but I think it's probably that they're just, the other species or other uh, families of insects aren't as receptive. Okay, Perry, sir. 
Um, what's the most colorful or like beautiful bug specimen or bug you've ever seen? Uh, um, there are uh, metallic wood boring beetles, uh, and or, or they're also called jewel beetles, and they are phenomenal looking. Uh, they've got like these pits that ref uh, refract light, and so they just have these beautiful metallic colors. Um, and I've got at least one. No, I don't have it with me. That was a lie. Uh, but there's an awesome book uh, that Asher and his family brought that has a ton of these really metallic, beautiful insects. So metallic ones were my favorite. There you go. <laughs> Mine too. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I want to do a couple final logistic pieces while you, also. yeah, talk to them, tell them to take it easy. Um, maybe Asher, when she gets them out, can you help me with it? Okay and maybe talk me through feeling okay. Um, so tonight's the last night. This often, I feel sort of a, a depression sink into the Sense of Place audience because you won't see us for months, and I'm sorry for that, um, which is a good time to remind you that all of this season is available online, so you can live stream it on a Friday night with your family. Um, we also have a companion podcast called Here in the Gorge, which if you have a phone and you go to the podcast app, you can go here in the gorge, H-E-A-R in the gorge, and you can hear stories about our tribal fishing history, our <coughs> Japanese history, Craig Rats, Mountain Search and Rescue, uh, all sorts of stuff, Woody Guthrie. So when you're out working in the garden looking for bugs, you can listen to the podcast. Um, I also want to remind you that the RFP, Request for Proposals, for season 15 is online and closes April 26th. So if you or someone you know has unique knowledge about the cultural or natural history of the Gorge and think you want to do what Maggie has done here tonight, um, you can go submit a proposal. I'm also always interested to hear in what folks want to hear about. You can send me an email because we also find speakers through direct outreach and some curating. Um, let's see. I think you have it already. Boy, that was really quick. <laughs> okay, Asher. Will you come help me out, bud? Okay. Do I? What should I be thinking about? Like, should I? How come you don't get scared? I don't know. They don't really hurt me. They don't hurt me, so it's not going to hurt me. It's right here, unless I try to pull it off. Okay. And so, all right. This is you guys. This is what should just hold it like that. Just hold, and it's not going to like. Listen, that's not funny. <laughs> And they, do they move fast? Not usually. Do I need to help? <laughs> no, she's just really gripping on to me. She, gripping, okay. Gripping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Ta-da! Okay. Wow. <laughs> if you were a kid and you want to come down and see this, this little, it's a female? It's a female. And I've heard these females, um, tell me about when they, well, what happened? You had one of these in your house. And what, here, hold on. Tell me about what happened with the female you had in your house. Well, it had these, like, eggs. It had these eggs. And where were the eggs? It had this, egg like, huge egg sack. A huge egg sack, Mom, <laughs> that was in its body or outside of its body? Well, we never saw it, like, well, we only saw it outside of its body. <laughs> okay. And was it, was it small or big? Like... Long. Okay, come here, Asher, come here so people can see. It had an egg sac outside of its body that was how big? Like, okay. long. And, and we're, th and this is just hard for me to even grasp this. It's full of baby cockroaches. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and so if they all decided to come out, you would have had a, a container full of baby cockroaches. Yeah. And what happened? Well, we just brung them back to Chris. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so mom and dad said, maybe we'll take the babies back to Chris. I like that. Do you want to hold it? Sure. Can you hold it and maybe take it around and show it to people while I do my final little bit? Oh, sh I think she likes you. There you go. And if you gently want to carry it and show it to people, that will help while I do this last little bit. Okay, so Asher, Asher's gonna show everybody the hissing cockroach. Um, 
while he does that, I want to thank, if you were in here and you have volunteered over the, you guys are welcome to go see if you want. Um, one more. Yeah, yeah. One. Yeah, we got one more. Come on down, guys. Um, for all of our volunteers, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> you guys will all have a chance to. <laughs> uh, thank you to the Columbia Gorge News. They were our headline sponsor along with the Oregon Cultural Trust this season. Thank you. Kyle, come out here. Kyle never gets in the spotlight. And usually at this time of, of the show, I pose like whatever the topic was. But this time, oh, like this? OK, but this time I want to do a selfie with you. Can you do a selfie? OK. All right, ready? No idea if I OK, we'll see if that worked. And then real quick. If you guys will help me, Joe, I don't usually let him out of his cage, but we're going to let him out tonight. So if we can all just chant, Joe, 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 he's not coming as fast. There he is, Joe Garut. Joe Garut. Joe helps do all our AV and our live stream. He also runs the shows over at Binge and Theater. He's Big Britches Production. He has a show coming up, Rumors. You Go see, see that boy here, and then you come over and see this Rumors. over there. Yeah. We have live theater again, so thank, thank you. Big love. Thank you to CCA and MAI. Thanks again to our sponsors. And tonight, most of all, <laughs> Maggie, will you uh, accept warm applause for Maggie Freeman and all of her insects? <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, look. <laughs> I love it. All right, come on down and see Maggie's insects and go out and see Asher's insects. Thanks so much, you guys. Did you touch it? Oh.